Hello, Shiver Seekers. Are you ready to follow us into the tropical unknown? I'm Cynthia. And I am Stephanie. You have found the Dark Oak. Stephanie, have I got a case for you today. It's a real life case, but it very much has that Blair Witch feel. Have you seen the movie? Um, Only like five times, even though I clearly know the end. <laughs> <laughs> and are you surprised every time? Um, Not necessarily surprised, but I'm like in a ball under the blankets every time because I am freaked out every single time. It is so creepy. It really is. I'm the same way. That one scares me. But today, <laughs> yes. today's case definitely kind of has those vibes. So today's case takes us all the way to Panama. And this is actually a pretty recent case that happened in 2014. So less than 10 years ago. I'm feeling very current and I'm feeling very tropical. Let's all go. Right, let's go. All right. Now, as I tell you this story, you are probably at first going to be able to see how this could have just been a tragic accident. And personally, I'm still not convinced that it isn't. However, as we go along, you will see that there are just enough really weird things that happened that leave a lot of people questioning if maybe there was some foul play or something else going on here. Are you ready? armchair detective cap on. <laughs> All right. So today I'm going to tell you the story of two Dutch women, Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon, who may forever be known as the Lost Panama Hikers. Chris Kremers was born on August 9th, 1992 to parents Rolly Grit and Hans Kremers, and she was 21 years old at the time that our story takes place. Chris was described as being a really open-minded person. She was very creative. She had just completed her studies in cultural social education, specializing in art education at the University of Utrecht. Lisanne Froon was born on September 24, 1991 to parents Dini and Peter Froon, and she was 22 years old. And her friends and family described her as being optimistic, intelligent, and she loved playing volleyball. She had graduated with a degree in applied psychology just about six months prior to this story. I totally feel like I would be friends with these girls. I know. They seem like very cool chicks. And as we go along, like, you're going to like them even more. Ugh, okay. Tell me more. Okay. Both women grew up in Amersfoort, Netherlands, and just a few weeks prior to the events we're going to talk about today, Chris and Lisanne had moved into a dorm room together back at Amersfoort, and they also worked together at a local restaurant. So for six months, these two women had been saving money so that they could go on a trip to Panama together to celebrate completing their studies. Now, a trip to Panama alone is pretty exciting, right? Heck yeah. But Chris and Lisanne decided that while they were in Panama, they were going to learn Spanish and actually give back to the community by volunteering with children at a village school. These are such sweet girls. I know, right? Like, not only are we going to go to Panama, but we're just going to, like, spend a month there volunteering. I love it. Pretty cool. So Chris and Lisanne arrived in Panama, and Panama is a small tropical country located north of Colombia, and the women arrived on March 15th, 2014. They'd planned on staying there for six weeks, and they had broken up this vacation into a couple of parts. So for the first two weeks, they were just going to relax, tour Panama, have fun, just enjoy the tropical vacation. But then that last month was going to be spent in a very small town called Boquette. And while they were there, they were going to be living with a local family and volunteering at that school. So the name of the place where they stayed is called Spanish by the River. And it's kind of like an Airbnb. They call it a hostel, but it's literally this little room with a separate entrance that's located on this family's property. Okay. I think it was like even attached to their house. Sounds really cool. I see why they would want to stay there. Right? Me too. 
So when the girls arrived in Boquet on March 29th, ready to volunteer at the school, they learned that there had been some kind of an administrative mix-up and the school wasn't actually ready for them yet. So the officials at the school told them to come back in like a week or so to see if their volunteer positions were available yet. Mm, got mixed feelings on this. <laughs> <laughs> so did they. <laughs> they were obviously disappointed, understandable. And they were keeping a diary of this trip. And they did write an entry where they talk about how even when whoever it was from the school told them we're not quite ready for you yet, they like weren't even very friendly and didn't act like they even appreciated the girls being there. Wah, wah. I know. It was very much like, we're not ready for you. Come back later kind of thing. So that would definitely be disheartening. Uh, yeah. Um, even though still Panama. Still Panama. And this did give them an extra week to explore and do more sightseeing and whatever else they wanted to do. So they spent a lot of this time taking some hikes that they hadn't originally planned on taking. Love it. So on April 1st, 2014, sometime after 11 a.m., but before 1 p.m., and this time discrepancy is based upon when the women were seen in the town, and they get dropped off at this trailhead by this taxi driver. And so he, you know, is able to just give an estimate of what time he dropped them off. But somewhere in that time frame, Chris and Lisanne went hiking near the clouded forests which is near the Baru Volcano on the El Pianista Trail, not far from Baquet. I, I have to stop you there and just say, like, the travel bug in me is, like, taking notes because it sounds amazing. And I bet they were so excited going into this. I'm a little hesitant to say that, though, because I feel like this story is, is going to take a turn here. It does not end well. Okay. But I am hoping that for the moments that they were here in this beautiful place, they enjoyed them and, you know. All right, we're going to go with that. Yes. But I will tell you, you do need to, like, Google search a clouded forest because it is exactly, like, what you would expect. Imagine a beautiful rainforest, but then, like, in the clouds. So it's both gorgeous and terrifying at the same time. It's amazing. I love it. Yes. And this entire area is surrounded by these small unnamed towns and indigenous areas and tribes. Now, no one really knows for sure where these women were headed on this hike. However, it is believed that they were going to be hiking this trail that leads to something called the Overlook. And the Overlook is where you can look out and see 360 degree views of the mountains and the surrounding rainforest. Ugh. Awesome. Amazing. So based upon what the women took with them, it appears that they were only planning on being out for just a few hours. They took no food with them. They only had one bottle of water with them between the two of them, which that's... rut row, Rorge. That's not what I would have done for even like a simple hike, but that's what, you know, they had with them. Gots to stay hydrated. <laughs> yes. They were both wearing tank tops and shorts, which probably isn't the best uh, choice of clothing if you're going to be out for a long hike in the I jungle. They're, all, they're in their 20s. I know. <laughs> Throw caution to the wind. <laughs> they're going to be scratching up those pretty, <laughs> those pretty, that pretty skin, you know what I mean? <laughs> and the girls were starting mid midday, you know, sometime between 11 and 1. So obviously they weren't planning on being out here for like a full day's hike. Now in Panama, it is highly, highly recommended that tourists take guides with them when they go on these hikes. Because this is like deep jungle. This is legit. And this particular hike was considered relatively well-traveled, but they still recommended you bring a guide. Makes sense. Yeah. Now, when I think well-traveled, what do you think when you think a well-traveled path? Well, like a designated trail without like sticks and brush and things like that. Like you obviously know where you're going. Right. But I also think, like, there's probably a lot of people coming and going. Yeah. Like, yeah. So I was just in Tennessee. I hiked Mount LeConte. And that's considered a very well-populated hike. And I went with a group, and we never went more than five minutes without running into another group of hikers. But even with that many other people on the trail, it would have been completely possible. Like, if I stepped off at just the right spot when there was no one else around to see or hear it, like, it could have taken a while to find me. Like, And that's with, like hundreds of people on this trail 
Yeah, and I imagine this clotted forest is a lot like that, too. Well, that's what I thought. I thought, well-traveled, you're going to be passing people. But actually, it seems like what well-populated or heavy, heavily populated in this area is like, if you stop on the trail somewhere because you're lost or injured or whatever, and you just stay there, someone might pass you like within a few hours. Oh, so a lot more isolated than maybe even the girls know. Exactly. Okay. Because when I think well-traveled, I'm thinking, oh, it'll be fine. There'll be other people. But it seems like. Okay. A little bit more truly in the jungle. Truly. Yes. Okay. So even though it is advised that these that any tourists take guides with them on these hiking expeditions. And regardless of the fact that the women had taken guides with them on their prior hikes and they had a hike planned for the next day and they already had a guide booked for that. But despite, you know, having guides for all these other hikes, this particular day, they decided that they were just going to go out on their own, just the two of them. I don't know. I mean, I guess at this point they had been there, what, like five weeks? So maybe they were kind of lulled into this like false sense of security maybe they had done so many other hikes and it had been fine maybe they didn't want to spend the money i mean they're there they're like newly college graduates and so i don't know i can see them again they're there in their tank tops they're just thinking it's just a little trip right all valid yeah all valid another thing i thought about um I guess the girls had made a Facebook post earlier in the day saying that they would be spending the day exploring the town. So that makes me think, well, maybe this hike was like a last minute choice. Totally. I can totally see that. They're like, you know, I heard this thing about the clotted forest and I know I would be like, well, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's do it. Let's go grab, yeah. grab a water bottle. Let's go. Yeah. I got my bestie. I got a water bottle. Like, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's my thought. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the terrain here in Panama. Here in Florida, when we go on a hike, it's like flat ground with some swampland maybe. You know, you might have to watch out for alligators. Uh, In the Smoky Mountains, Mount Lacan, you know, you got some steep rocks, maybe some drop-offs along the side. But if you need to like step off any of these trails for a minute to say, you know, go pee or anything like that, you could do so pretty safely, find your way back. Not a huge deal. But in a rainforest in Panama, if you veer off the trail, you are immediately in chest high vegetation with spiky, pokey, stinging plants. There's cliffs, rocks, drop offs. There's poisonous insects, snakes, spiders, scorpions. So really getting off the trail at all is not a good idea if you do not know exactly where you are and exactly what you are doing. I'm beginning to change my idea about this cloud forest. <laughs> we'll just Maybe take a guide. Not, it's not as romantic. Yeah, I don't know. Unless I have some guide that's going to, like, you know, fend off poisonous scorpions. I don't know. Like, I'm going to need, like, a, like a pest man. Yeah. Like, sure. <laughs> and also somebody with, like, a machete to cut down the stinging vines. Right. But that's another reason why, like, just wearing a tank top and shorts is probably not the best attire like here in florida okay sure but like this is like you know you're gonna cut up yeah not very practical no all right i'm picking up what you're putting down right so just remember as we go along this is not a beginner walk in the woods this is literally a scary dangerous jungle so the two women start this hike and already off the bat witnesses remember seeing different things It was reported that the women took a dog with them named Azul, and this was either the host family's dog, or I've also read reports saying that this dog was more of like a neighborhood dog that just kind of belonged to everybody. So cute. I know. How cute. And this dog went with them, or at least many people believe that this dog went with them. However, none of this is verified. This is all just like witnesses saying, oh, yeah. This happened, but none of it can be like absolutely officially verified. I would have totally taken Azul with me as well. Me too, right? That would make me feel safer. Yeah, truly. absolutely. So the report of the dog came about when locals said that they saw the dog with the two women at one point during the day. And before they had left on their hike, the women were seen having brunch with two young Dutchmen that morning. And these two groups did not go there together. Um, they just kind of met up. 
at some time during their travels. And they had the girls had spent some time with these two men prior. It, you know, from all accounts, seemed like it was just an innocent friendship developing. They had a lot in common being from the same country. And, you know, they were just four Dutch travelers. Yeah, fun. Absolutely. So later that evening, Azul the dog came back without Chris and Lisanne. And around that same time, both women's families stopped receiving text messages, which up until that point, they had been receiving regularly. Uh Uh-oh. Yes. By the following morning, the women had failed to meet up with that local guide who was scheduled to take them on that day's hike. So someone alerted the authorities that the two women were missing. And even that, like varies the information you find on this varies depending on what source you're looking at but what seems to be most heavily reported was that it was actually that guide who reported to the authorities that the women were missing that they never showed up oh that's very responsible it is and also i'm wondering like how did he you know i just don't know how that happened did he was i don't know yeah i mean i guess maybe with that i mean I don't know if I have a guy like maybe they were friends. Had he taken them on other hikes before that? I don't know. I don't know if he knew where they were staying and he maybe was going to meet them at the host family's house. And then the host family was like, oh, they never came back last night. Yeah, good point. You know, so I don't know how all that came about. Okay, But whatever reason, he was like a good Samaritan. And he was like, listen, I think there's something weird going on. Yes. According to some reports. Okay, well, kudos to him (laughs) if this report is true. Correct. So on April 3rd. Two days after the women set out on this journey, authorities began aerial searches of the forest. And they also started performing uh, searches on foot along with many of the locals who lived in the town. Yeah. No one found any trace of the missing women. Nothing. Ooh. So three days later on April 6th, Chris and Lisanne's parents arrived in Panama and they participated in a full scale search of the forest that lasted 10 days. These poor parents. I I literally cannot. I I cannot imagine. How helpless. How like you hear that something went wrong. You're far away. You get there. This I mean, no, it's just it's a nightmare. And it's clear. I mean, these girls came from these awesome families that they're I mean, without a hesitation, their parents just jumped on a plane. And we're like, we're going to go, like, look for these girls. Right. And they brought support. I mean, police, dog units, detectives, all the way from the Netherlands were brought in to help look for these missing women. But despite all of this, for searching, after searching for 10 days with all of these, you know, people, there was not even one trace that the women had ever even been in this forest. Mm. Like, nothing. Well, they were definitely there because of the taxi driver's account, right? They were there. And we will later learn we do have photographs. They were there. Okay. So they definitely were there. They were there. Okay. But you would think you might find something. Nothing. So the women's parents offered a $30,000 reward for any information leading to their whereabouts. And even after that, no one was able to offer any information at all. Now, let me break this down. Let me give you some perspective. $30,000 in Panama is the equivalent of $500,000 here in the United States. So this is a lot of money. A lot of money. Okay, so they were serious. This is serious. And that's that's enough to make you talk. Like, if you know something, $500,000, you're going to talk. And this is a country where, like, you know, it's... Yeah. You could use that money. Yeah. So despite all this, no footprints. Not a shred of clothing, not a broken twig that could be like pointed back to them. Nothing found that pointed to either women ever having been on that trail. Oh, so creepy. It's yeah. And that's how the search went. That was it. That was the search. Nothing was ever found. Nothing ever came from that search. How disheartening for those parents. It's like your kids are there and then they're just gone. Gone. And you have zero answers. Desperate. And you just have to walk away. You never get those answers. Did they wind up even going back home? Eventually. Oh my gosh. I don't know. I mean, I think I just would have like, (laughs) I don't know. I would have like set up a second house there. I mean, now, of course, this is like, clearly money is no object, but I just, oh my gosh, I can't even put myself in their shoes right now. No, it's, it's terrible. So that's where things landed. And it's, they stayed that way for 10 weeks. 10 weeks, so oh, two and a half months. Gosh. But then on June 14th, an indigenous woman 
who was working in a rice paddy near the village of Alto Romero, which is located in the Bocas de Toro region. And this is about five miles north of where Chris and Lucanne were thought to have been hiking. But this woman found a blue backpack near a riverbank. And this woman worked in this area several times a week. In fact, she had just been there the day before. And she told authorities she was absolutely positive that this bag had not been there the day before. Whoa. I don't know this woman. But when she says, I was just here yesterday and this bag was not here, I believe that. I believe that. Oh, is there some speculation she knows more than... No, no. Okay, but so nobody's just... suspecting this woman no. of anything. No, but okay. it's just, I guess my point is, it's very strange that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, 10 weeks after these women went missing, this blue backpack shows up. Oh, absolutely. And part of what makes it strange is this right here. Okay. Authorities were able to determine that this backpack belonged to the missing hiker, Lisanne Froon. And here it was found along this riverbank 10 weeks after its owner went missing in the middle of the jungle. So clearly, this backpack probably just washed up onto the bank from the river, right? Like, yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Except this backpack was not a proper camping or hiking backpack. It was just a very inexpensive, like thin nylon bag. Like calling it a backpack is being very generous. Imagine just like a thin nylon bag. So it wasn't waterproof. It wasn't sturdy. And this bag, if it had been floating in a river for two and a half months or sitting in the middle of a rainforest for two and a half months, this backpack should have been dirty, wet, mildewed, torn. I mean, it should have shown some wear and tear, right? Well, yeah. I mean, we just go hiking, you know, here and it just gets sand, it gets scuffed, it gets right. bugs on it. I mean, something. Right. But this backpack was found clean, dry, no damage. It looked as if someone had just literally laid this backpack on the side of this riverbank. And then someone else came along right after that and found it. Like, that's what it looked like. It did not look like it had spent the last 10 weeks anywhere outside. Okay. Weird. Very weird. It gets weirder. So in addition to the bag being dry and in great condition, this backpack was found five miles north of where the women had been hiking. But this river that it was found on didn't flow north. So it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense how this backpack would have washed up the river. That could have only happened if somehow the women had ended up over five miles north of where we believe their intended hike was. And then they dropped the bag and then it washed up. You see what I'm saying? Like it was in the but wrong direction. And it, But it wasn't wet. So right. it probably wasn't in the river at all. Right. But even if it had been. But even if it had been. So it's like, okay, why were they up there? Like, because I mean, I would like to think that they were the ones that dropped it. But strange. Very strange. And if they had been the ones that dropped it, this detour would have been off of any path. And they would have literally been like off-roading it for more than five miles. And again, this is not a cleared path. This is jungle. This is like you need a machete to ch chop down like for five miles to get to this place where this backpack was found. And I just can't find any normal circumstances that would have caused them to travel that far off course for any reason. Like I just can't. I just can't figure out why they would have tried to have done that. No. Everything I've seen and read about them, these are not reckless women. They are adventurous, but you can be adventurous and still be safe. You don't have to be reckless. Sure. And I mean, case in point, every other hike they had gone on, they had taken a guide. Exactly. Um, I just don't see them being like, let's off-road it with no machetes, which we need to even be able to like walk three feet. With no water, no food, in our tinnies and our tank tops. Yeah, like, limited clothing. Yeah. yeah. For some perspective on just the whole area, the overlook that everyone believes these girls were hiking to was only about a half a mile from where they were actually staying. It, you know, it was a hike. It was a serious hike, but it was still pretty close. Like, it was all lumped together. So, again, for this backpack to have ended up five miles north, like, that's just, it just makes no sense. Sure. 
Now, inside the backpack were two pairs of sunglasses, 83 U.S. dollars, Lisanne's passport, a single water bottle, Lisanne's camera, which was a Canon PowerShot SX270 digital camera, two bras. Now, these are listed as bras, but when you look at the photos, to me, they look like bathing suit tops, which makes sense that, like, maybe the girls thought we could go for a swim or something. So, yeah, sure. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then both women's phones. So all of this was found in the backpack. Now, every single one of these items was clean and in working condition. Okay, not what I expect to find in the jungle. Right, after two and a half months. So the camera and the two cell phones that authorities insist had been floating down the river still worked. Batteries were dead, but once they were charged, everything worked. So once the phones were turned back on, authorities were able to try to piece together what the women might have done after they left for this obviously very ill-fated hike. The phones show that just a few hours after the beginning of their hike, someone called 911. And 911 is an international emergency number, and so it should have rang to local authorities. However, the call did not go through due to lack of service. Now, the phones also showed that they dialed 112, which is the Panama equivalent to 911, but again, the call did not go through due to, new ser- due to no service. Now, I'm going to give you all the calls and the timeline. It's going to be a lot, probably too much to follow, but I think it's just important to, like, hear it, like, what they're doing, and then afterwards we can discuss. Yeah. So the first call was made at 4.39 p.m. on Chris's phone, still daylight. If they started their hike around 11 or noon, you know, we're just a few hours in. The second call was made 12 minutes later at 4.51 from Lisanne's phone. Two attempted emergency calls after only have having been out for a few hours. And at the time of those calls, there were still several hours of daylight left. But then there is no phone activity at all until 14 hours later, when at 6.58 a.m., Lisanne's phone again tried to call 112. Then a little over an hour later, Chris's phone attempted 112. At 10.52 a.m., Lisanne's phone called 112 and 911, and then that phone was turned off. A few hours later, at 1.50 p.m., her phone was turned back on, presumably to check for signal but then turned off. Then Lisanne's phone called 911 and actually connected for about a second before being disconnected. So she's obviously making several phone calls, trying to reach somebody, and it connects for a second. What would you do? If I was Lisanne, Mm -hmm. uh, I would start rapidly dialing over and over and over, hoping that whoever's on the other end can at least piece together what's going on. Right? Yeah. You would keep trying. Yes. She turned her phone off 30 seconds later. 36 oh. seconds later, she turned it off and did not turn it back on for more than two hours. Maybe she didn't know it connected? I don't know. That I don't oh, know. But I, gosh. to me, that is so weird. Like, it connected for a second and then didn't even try again. Oh. Very strange. Yeah. And unfortunate. Right. So two and a half li- hours later, she turned her phone back on. Again, we are presuming to search for a signal, and the phone was actually kept on, on kept on all night, but then turned off at 7.36 a.m. the next morning. So on April 3rd, almost exactly two hours after Lisanne turned her phone off, Chris's phone was turned on. It attempted to call 911 at 9.32 a.m., and then her phone was turned off. It was turned on again about two hours later at 11.47 a.m. to check for signal, then turned off, then turned on again about four hours later at 4 p.m. to check for signal. Then almost 13 hours later at 4.50 a.m., Lisanne's phone is turned on again to check for signal, then turned off, then turned on again 10 minutes later to check for signal. Then the battery died and there was no further activity from her phone. Five hours later, Chris's phone's turned on to check for signal, then turned off, then turned on again, about three and a half hours later, then turned off. The following day, which is April 5th, 21 hours later from most recent call, attempted call, Chris's phone is turned on again to check for signal, then turned off, and then three hours later, turned on. But this time, and every time from here on out that the phone was turned on, the wrong pin was entered, and the phone would never unlock. 
So 21 hours later on April 6th, of the girl, after the girls had been missing for five days, Chris's phone is turned on again at 1026 a.m. The wrong pin is entered. The phone's turned off. Three hours later, it's turned on again. Wrong pin is entered. Phone is turned off. Five days after that, April 11th, the phone's turned on. Wrong pin is entered. The phone stays on for about an hour. And at 11.56 a.m., the phone is turned off and the phone is never again turned on despite having 22% battery left. Okay. I know that was way too much information. Hard to follow. But I just think it it just kind of shows like, I don't know, it shows something. It shows that they're like desperate, desperate to save battery. But then there's like these weird passages of time. They'll go an hour or they'll go three hours. Or sometimes they go 24 hours. Or sometimes they go five days. Like, it's just very weird. It's a bit chaotic. It's very chaotic. You know, I mean, there's no, like, strategy. Um, Now, were they, I'm not sure anything about, like, cell phone tracking in, like, 2014. And I'm not sure, especially in, like, Panama. But are they able to find out, like, where they were calling from? Like, was it in a general area? Did it show they were moving around? Like, were they, like let's get to the top of this hill and then we'll try again. Right. That is a very good question. And if if that was discovered, it's not been widely reported. Okay. Because so it would be interesting to find, you know, maybe they had like a goal in mind. Like we're going to hike to this clearing or we're going to hike to the top of whatever this is and see if we have signal there. Um, I can't imagine going... I mean, in my panic, if I'm genuinely lost Mm -hmm. in the jungle, I don't know if I could go a full, like, 12, 15 hours without turning my phone on again. Right. Right. Me neither. I mean, even conserving battery. I just don't, I don't know if I could do that. Like, I would just be so panicked or I would try to think of something like, okay, every hour I'm going to turn it on or every few hours, like some kind of, like, pattern or something. I agree. Um, But weird. It is very weird. And there are theories. And that's why I wanted to lay out all the different phone calls. Because even though in the moment you're probably like, what are you talking about? But there are theories as to why that might have happened in the way it did. And I will get to those later. I don't know that they're good theories, but they are theories. Well, anything's better than what I'm thinking, which is like (laughs) big question mark over my head. (laughs) That's the thing. This case is just full of so many like that doesn't quite make sense. So my first big question is, why did they call for help in the first place? They were only like at the most five or six hours in, but probably less than that, just a few hours in. So why, what happened to cause them to realize they needed help? Like just a few hours into the hike, did somebody get hurt? Did they feel like they got lost? It was still daylight. They still had several hours of daylight time left. So I don't know if they stayed on the path or close to the path. Like, I just I just wonder, like, what caused them to realize something was wrong in the first place so quickly? And then on top of that, why make two emergency phone call attempts, but then stop trying for hours? Like, that's the other thing. Like, I think at that point, okay, I understand days in when they've been you know, trying, 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 and nothing's going through. I can understand being like, well, I'll try one more time and see if it works. But at this point, you've only tried twice. Like, I feel like in the beginning, I would have tried a little more. But they didn't. True. True. So, Uh, you know, especially, I mean, if you're, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just me, but something's got to be pretty bad for me to be like, I'm going to include, like, authorities here. So... I mean, what would have been so bad that they would have called originally, but then not felt the need to follow up quickly? Exactly. That's that's the big question mark for me. Like you felt the need to call while you're in another country, you felt the need to call, but then for whatever reason, didn't keep calling. Right. And again, there are some theories that I will get into, but still just on its own. That's weird. So one of the things that I wondered maybe might explain that is like, what if they started out, maybe they, you know, deviated from the path a little bit, or maybe even they didn't, maybe they just, you know, got turned around or 
they started heading back and they didn't recognize something and they thought maybe we took a wrong turn. I mean, who knows? Now, I'm assuming, I mean, it's a jungle. Right. Are there dangerous animals? Sure. Of course. Yes. For sure. Okay. I mean, is that a possibility? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Uh, nothing is an impossibility, I don't think, at this point. Okay. Because I'm just thinking of things that could, like, really mess up your day. Absolutely. Um, you know, a wild animal, a tree falling, stepping off and just twisting your ankle, getting bitten by a snake or something like that. So, right. um, you know, any of these things would have been perfectly legitimate reasons to seek help. Yes. But I can't figure out. I mean, maybe one of those was injured and was like, listen, I think we can walk our way back to the trailhead or something like that. Um, but even that, I can't imagine, even if they were only a few hours in, even if one was helping the other one like limp along, it wouldn't be 12 hours. Right. They shouldn't have been because they'd only been out there for a few hours. Like if that happened, say you broke an ankle or you got bit or something, then, okay, we're going to turn around. We're going to head back. Yeah, it's going to take us longer. We have an injury or whatever. Or even if one of them went back. Right. And said, I'm going to go back up to the front. I'll come back. Right. Exactly. They still should have made it back. Right. Like they were not days into this hike. Right. But again, that's just one of the things that just doesn't make oh, a lot of sense. It's so crazy. I know. I know. It's terrible. Um, and that was kind of what I thought. I thought, okay, maybe like somebody hurt themselves or something like that. So they called 911, but then we're like, wait a minute, we're panicking here. Like, it's going to be okay. Let's, you just walk back and get help or let's hobble back together and get help. Right. Or let's, um, we think we took a left. So let's, let's try this path. Like maybe that's why they didn't keep calling 911. Yeah. They were like, okay, listen. We can't get through. Let's try to solve this problem ourselves. Right. We're smart cookies. Like, right. let's see if we can power through this. Right. But I don't know that I would have tried anything for 12 hours. Like, I'm a pretty, I like to think I'm a pretty confident woman, but I don't know. I would have to feel pretty confident to wait overnight in the jungle. Exactly. To call someone again. And it was actually 14 hours. It was 14 hours from those two initial and calls. And 14 to the hours, next. not just of like, broad daylight like 14 hours overnight in a jungle in panama you got it which at that point now you are like if you're in a jungle if you're spending night in a jungle as a foreigner you are like you should be panicked like something's bad this is like like this day did not turn out the way i expected right okay so yeah i think that and perspective i mean of course all the other like on and off phone calls and stuff but that part to me is almost the most peculiar. Like, I made two phone calls. They didn't go through. I'm going to sleep overnight in the jungle in lieu of trying to call again. Right. Yeah, I don't know that I would have made the same choices. <laughs> but again, we don't know what led to those choices. Right. And we don't know if that was all they were able to do. Oh, girl, so, tell me more. We'll see. We talked a bit about how weird it would be, like, to call 911, have it connect, and then not keep trying. Yeah, that's weird. You know, that's another weird thing. So here's the theory about the phone calls. The one that's, like, most often talked about, which actually does make some sense. So what if these two women had been abducted while they were on this trail? Oh. They were abducted. And then they were either allowed to keep their phones because whoever it was that took them knew that the phones were pretty much worthless or they somehow hid their phones and they only tried using them when they were in a position where they thought they could do so and not get caught. Okay. The story just took a whole level, another level of creep. That could explain it though, right? Like, oh I'm trying to gosh. sneakily I hate to think about these, like, sweet girls, like, being held hostage. But, yeah, I mean, that would make sense. I mean, there are very few things that would keep me from trying to call again if I just had my own free will. Right. So I see why this theory has some merit. Right. Now, I don't understand why um, someone would allow them to keep their phones in the first place. Like, I think that's still taking quite a chance to be like, oh, I know there's no service up here. But. And I also think, you know, if they are pulling their phone, like, I don't know how you would do that. Maybe, maybe during the night when people are sleeping, 
Oh, wait, no, that's not when they made their calls. So, like, I don't know. I don't know. It's just very, I don't know. But that is a theory, and it kind of could explain away some of just the sporadic calling and the why you wouldn't keep trying. Yeah. And also could explain why they never made it back to the trailhead, even though they hadn't gone very far in the first place. Oh, gosh. my Literally, my stomach just, like, fell. Right. Oh, gosh. Like, what if they ran into somebody, tried calling 911 because they realized these people are bad news, and then that was it? Other people think that maybe just the constant turning of the phones on and off um, is just to conserve the battery, which also makes sense. But again, you would think you'd have some kind of a plan when it comes to, okay, we're going to turn it on every hour or we're going to turn it on every time we make it to like a peak or whatever. So Lisanne's phone died on April 4th. And then from that afternoon on, we only have Chris's phone. And beginning on April 5th, whoever is using Chris's phone doesn't appear to know the pin. Do you have any thoughts on that? All I can think, I mean, I'd like to think that these women didn't fall like into the wrong hands i'd like to think this is something natural this is something a freak accident something like that and so i mean if you're in the jungle that long no food and water maybe it was lisanne trying to use chris's phone and was just delirious or she didn't know it even though that would be really weird you think she would have asked chris (laughs) what is it like say something terrible befell chris you would think she she would have eased asked her right. what it was beforehand like again like have a plan right less chaotic okay listen in case you need my phone here's my pen in case you need my you know like exchanged right. information but outside of that i can't think of anything that's not totally sinister right and that was my thought too okay delirium i could see yeah. i can see just being like not all there um i can see something having happened to the owner of the phone and the other woman trying to right. crack the code. But again, why not share that information? But again, if it were you and me in that moment, now if it were you and me, I think that we would probably be like, okay, here's the plan. You especially, because you, I think you would just be like, give me your code, give me this, like, because that's you. I would probably, I don't know. I've asked myself, would I have thought that far in? And I like to think I would have, but would I actually have been like, hey, in the event I need to use your phone, what is your code? I don't know. Oh, that's fair. I mean, here they are. I mean, again, if it's something, if someone has them captive, again, it's just chaos. Just chaos, right. Just chaos. I mean, you're not thinking ahead, like, and maybe the girls were separated, even though how would the other one find the phone? I don't know. Yeah, I don't I don't know either. And then, of course, the other theory is that someone else completely had their phone. So they're confused. The wrong girl has the wrong phone or somebody bad has the phone. Right. Those three theories might explain why the phone is turned off for five days straight. And then when it is turned on again, the wrong passcode is entered. But here's the really weird thing. Oh, it gets weirder. (laughs) Well, just another level. In 2017, both of these phone models were equipped with the emergency call feature. So they wouldn't have needed to know the pin to make an emergency call. Oh, also here standing up. I don't like that. I don't like that, Cynthia. Well, and I still don't even really know what the explanation for that is. I knew that my phone has an emergency because when my kids were younger, I taught them how to use my, you know, we don't have a house phone anymore. So I showed my kids, like, if you ever needed help, you would pick up mommy's phone, you would press this button, and you would put in 911. I taught my kids that. If I hadn't been teaching my kids that for that reason, would I have even paid attention to the, I don't know. And would somebody who maybe lived in Panama and went around abducting women, would they know that you can pick up a phone and hit emergency contact? But then again, if you're abducting women, you wouldn't want to be calling. You know, I can see you picking up a phone and trying to unlock it to do other things with it, but you wouldn't pick up the phone and like make an emergency phone call if you are the one who's abducted these women. So let's talk about the camera. That should shed some light on what oh happened, gosh. right? With all this crazy with the phone, I totally forgot about the camera. Oh no, there's a camera. And they were taking photos. So this is going to give us a lot of uh, information. Oh my gosh, please tell me <laughs> there's some like picture of like a jaguar jumping oh, out of the jungle well, or there's, something. There's stuff. I don't know that there's anything that clear. The photos start off as you would expect. Pictures of two smiling tourists hiking. Burr, burr, burr. They're taking beautiful photos of each other and selfies and you can tell they're happy. It's wonderful. 
Like, you know, so I do think they started off having a great day and that's wonderful. Based on what we can see in the surroundings, it does appear to confirm that the women had been on that trail to the overlook. Okay. So based okay, on the. They were definitely there. Yes, they were there. And that's how we know they were there. There's photos. And in these photos, the two women do look happy. Now, there are a couple of photos in this series towards the end of this group of pictures where some people speculate that Chris, who's a quite a bit of a distance away from the camera, might look a little distressed. Oh. Now, to me, I looked at it and I was like, I don't know that you can say that. Like, it could have just been like, Lisanne snapped a photo and she wasn't expecting it. You know what I mean? Okay, fair. But it could also be, oh, something's wrong. Like, it could be many different things. But a lot of people talk about that. Oh, look at this photo. She's clearly scared and upset. Okay. But it could have just been a candid shot it, that she wasn't prepared for. Exactly. We have these daylight photos from April 1st, the day they left on this hike. Then there are no photos taken for a week, one week. But then on April 8th, so this is during the five days where there's no phone activity because Lisanne's phone had died and Chris's phone had been turned off. But during that five days, someone took 90, 90 flash photographs between the hours of 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. So three hours, Whoa. 90 flash photographs in three hours. Whoa. In the middle of the night, like the dead of night. Oh, it's so weird. And in these photographs, it appears to be complete darkness in the deep jungle. This averages out to one photograph taken every two minutes for those three hours. Okay. Now, many of these photos show absolutely nothing that appears to be of any significance. A lot of them just look like specks in the dark, maybe some sky shots, uh, maybe the side of someone's finger or face, like, you know, in front of the lens, some possible rain. We really don't know what we're looking at in a lot of these photos. It's, again, just chaotic. But the photos that do capture objects are strange. So I want you to look at this photo. Okay. Because a lot of people see what appears to be a body laying at the bottom of, to me, it looks like we're at the top of a cliff here okay. and you're looking down over the side of a cliff. And a lot of people think that this is a body right there. Tell me what you see. Mm, I mean, I see why it's a little lighter. I mean, there's definitely something that, but it just looks like a branch to me. I don't know. Maybe if we blew it up a little more, like with some special photo technology. Um, obviously, I think it's worth looking into if it will add any answers to this case. But to me, it just kind of looks like a branch. Right. I think with what we're looking at here, we're stretching it to say, oh, yes, that's a body. I mean, it could be. Sure. Absolutely could be. But we're stretching. And I'm sure there is technology out there that would, I don't know, examine this to the extent where they could give us more details. But yeah, I don't see it from my untrained eye right now. I don't see anything but a branch. That That's my thought too. Okay. So look at this photo. Now this photo for you listeners shows what appears to be just like a twig with maybe like some little plastic bags, like little sandwich bags almost, and like some candy wrappers on top of a rock. Yeah, to me, you know those like marker flags where mm -hmm. like the phone company comes out or the water company and they put those little flags so you don't like cut something? Yes. They look like the top of those flags. That's like, exactly red. what it looks like. Yeah, they yes. look like red flags is what they look like tied onto some like twigs on top of a rock. Which is weird though. Why would you okay. tie red? Okay, so my thought is, well, maybe they're trying to mark a spot. But they're small. small. It's yeah. not like a, It's not like anybody could see that or a wind blows. A like, wind blows and it's going to blow away. Like, yeah. even if it's for them just to be like, hey, we've been here, like, I would at least weight it down with a rock or something. Like, I can understand putting something on a rock. We're going to see this rock. We're going to know that this is the rock. But this is like a flimsy little twig with like some little, you know, yeah. paper. Like, yeah. who's going to say that's going to be there in an hour? Oh, yeah. That, mm, I don't know that I would choose that as a marker. But then again, you're trying to use whatever you can find, right? right? And we don't know that that's what it was, but like that's what else would it be? Ugh, I mean, this I don't is know. So weird it's so weird, night. right? It's so weird. Okay, there's other photos that look like uh, maybe a piece of paper and a mirror on top of a rock. Okay. Which again, what's with that? But then the most unsettling photo is this one here. 
It appears to be a close-up of Chris, but all you can see is her hair. Oh, me no likey this picture. No, it's not good. I do not like this one. Now, this one is, that we're looking at here is unedited. So in this one, it really does just look like a bunch of hair. Oh, you guys, it looks like like a blonde wig has just been tousled around and like bunched up in a corner. Yes. And someone took a picture of it. Yes. But I saw a version where they kind of enhanced it and kind of showed what potentially could be underneath that like mess of hair. And it, look at this. It, to me, I see what potentially could be like a face and like a mouth like in a snarl Ooh. type and like what Ooh. could be an eye and if okay. if that's what we're looking at Ooh. that's that's not good and why would anyone take this photo why would you if what we are looking at okay so if it's just the back of her head and just in the middle of chaos they accidentally hit the uh, you know you accidentally hit the shutter button and took a picture and all you got was hair okay fine like there's a lot of weird stuff going on you're outside like who knows but if Chris is deceased. So the theory is she's lit. she's, I mean, because it's just a mess of hair. It's right? just a mess of hair with potentially her face underneath it in a snarl. Okay. So either it's a picture of her, like she's laying face down or because the way the hair is laid out, it's not like she's, it doesn't look like she's vertical. It but, looks like she's horizontal. Is that what you're Horizontal feeling? or to me on the side. Okay. Fair. But laying down. Yes. So the idea is she could be laying like face down yes in which case this is just the back of her head correct or she could be face up where through the strands of hair you can see features of a face mm -hmm. but her hair is covering it right which is oh to me even weirder oh, so weird and then the features of the face again are like her face is in an unnatural snarled like not a nice okay yeah don't like this don't yeah. like this right and then some people look at that photo and they even think they see specks of blood in her hair which Ooh. i don't see that i don't see specks of blood but i do see i don't but actually outline. i don't really want to look at the photo anymore no. so somebody else can do that no but either way it's just a creepy photo uh yes okay. especially with all the other creepy things right that are now in this case right Cynthia, we should totally post this hair photo to our social. We can. We okay. can. So we should post. We can do this. We can post yeah. just the raw version. Yes. But then we could also like post the one that has kind of like the outline of what could be like okay, guys. the nostril after and the we, teeth. After we post this, we're, I'm going to post some pictures <gasps> on you on the socials. Ooh. And um, tell us what you guys think. Yeah, please. Please. Because that's what I was going to say. Like you can go on Reddit. You can go on all these different websites. People like deep dive this case and you know they've broken it down no this is her nostril right here or this is specks of blood or no if you do this and you like lighten this or darken this like you see that so you could literally spend hours down this rabbit hole of what these photos are we're totally gonna share uh do, do you notice anything about her hair in this photo though like to me her hair looks very clean for being out in the jungle for a week like mine would be like an oily mess which might be a hair type thing but like doesn't her hair look like it's not like wet and no, I will agree. I mean, it looks kind of like matted. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, it doesn't look greasy or wet or muddy. Right. It looks clean. Definitely matted, definitely disheveled, but it does look clean, which I thought, well, that's interesting because mine would not be. Now, here's what is possibly the strangest finding when it comes to the photos. Photo number 509 was deleted from the camera. Okay. 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 The girls are taking photos. Many of what appear to be nothing, right? These photos out, outside, sky, twigs, rocks, hair. In order for the camera to show that photograph number 509 was deleted means that it had to have been deleted after at least the very next photo was taken. So if you're taking photos and you take photo number 509 and you don't like it and you delete it and then you take another photo that new photo becomes photo 509 right does that make sense yeah but if you take photo numbers 508 509 510 511 and then you go back and erase 509 you will be left with what we have in this scenario which is photos 506 507 508 
5, 10, 5, 11, on and on and on. So what's weird about this? We erase photos we don't like all the time, right? But if you're outside in the scenario that... Like in a chaotic panic. Taking photos of nothing anyway. It's not like all of these photos are like great photos. And then, oh, this one really is really not flattering of you. So let me delete. Like, they're all oh. just photos of nothing, right? Right. So why go back and delete just this one after having taken a bunch of other photos? So it it wasn't even accidental. Like, you know what I mean? I can Ooh, see like... Did they take a picture of something they weren't supposed to? I don't know. Oh, I don't like it. You're... It, it, every time you're like, okay, this is too weird. I'm going to be like, and it gets weirder. No. <laughs> so that photo... 509 was the photo that was taken in between the daytime photos. So like the happy daytime, we're going on a hike photos and the creepy nighttime photos. Eee. So somewhere between when they left on their hike Eee. and when things got real creepy. I literally can't stop making guttural noises right. because that's how I feel right now. I feel like I want to sink into this chair and not hear any more of this because it's totally creeping me out. So creepy. So okay. that photo absolutely could have been of whatever it was that ultimately caused them not to come back that night. Ooh. Like, we don't know what it was, but we know it was in between those two. What or who? Who? Oh, exactly. Oh, gosh. Who makes more okay. sense? Okay. Oh, who makes more sense? And I don't like that. No, no. Now, here's where it gets even worse. So, as we have learned, I am not a techie person, right? <laughs> No comment. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, if you delete a photo off of your camera, there is a way for a forensic expert to be able to go back and retrieve that photo. Okay. Oh, it's good it's to a know. thing. Yeah. Very good to know. Which makes sense because, like, you know, nothing's sacred, nothing's hidden, nothing's private. There's actually a professional software that makes this a really easy thing to do. So in a case where two women go missing and then they find their camera, that would absolutely be one of the first things they do. Let's go see what this missing photograph is of, of right? Course. Like, of course. There are experts who do this. Of course. They did do this. This camera was sent to these experts to come in and try to find that missing photo. But it is gone. Like, gone, gone. Which means this photo was not erased from the camera. This photo was deleted from the camera card. And the only way to do that was to connect the camera's card to a computer and manually delete the photo, then put the card back in the camera. What? So someone went to very, very great oh, lengths. Oh, boy. Okay, yeah. To make sure this photo was never, ever, ever going to be seen. Okay, but I'm thinking, I mean... We're setting the scene, right? Panama jungle, you know, hiker. And I'm thinking, um, you know, like an indigenous person that lives, like someone, like a local, like right. a Panamanian local. I I'm thinking, and based on where they're found, I'm thinking somebody that's like very wood savvy and things. I don't know. At least in my experience, you're not like incredibly like jungle savvy and tech savvy at the same time. Like I wouldn't know those two things. Doesn't it make it seem like it's a much bigger operation? Ooh, yeah. Like that's so what... maybe not like the someone, maybe the someone's right. plural. Maybe like I don't know. Maybe this is a trafficking oh, scenario. Like gosh, maybe this is a, a gang type scenario. Maybe yes. this is a drug mule type scenario. Like yes, this because exactly was this area known for like drug running or anything like that we will get into that but there is some there is some like sketchy stuff that happens in this area oh gosh these girls didn't know what they didn't know they did not know what they didn't know oh man so there are some theories for this these photos uh one of which is maybe they were trying to signal for help using the flash valid makes sense right okay sure. i mean they are out in the middle of the nowhere so it is you know there, I don't have high hopes that somebody's just going to happen to see all this flashing going off in the woods in the middle of the night. But, yeah. like, is it worth trying? Sure. Another theory is maybe they were trying to scare away a predator. Okay. Like, I can totally see that. Yeah, me too. 
perhaps they were trying to light their way in the dark. I can totally see that too. Absolutely. Especially if they're like trying to like escape. Right. Exactly. Were they trying to leave a message for whoever found them and or their belongings as to what happened to them? So like, hey, if we don't make it out of here, when someone finds this camera, they're going to be able to look back and figure out where we were and what we, you know, Yeah. which I would think that one holds less weight for me because I would think if that's what you're trying to do, you would take more clear photos. Probably not the sky or like random bugs and right. stars and stuff. Yeah. Right. But still a theory. Yeah, and maybe that explains, like, that little twiggy thing they made. Like, that's throwing me off, too. That little marker with the flag, the flag marker. That makes no twigs. sense. because like, it, that doesn't make any sense to me. Right, because it's not naturally occurring in nature. Like, somebody put this, and that's where things get, like, player witchy. Because it's like, somebody made this little thing. Like, yeah. somebody took, like, little candy wrappers or pieces of plastic or pieces of flags or whatever and tied them to a twig, placed it on a rock, and then took the time to take a photo. And if you're... And a rush to, like, escape. Are you going to take the time to do that? No. But I don't know why you would do that in the first place. Unless maybe you're trying to leave a marker for yourself that, okay, you know what? This might explain. Because we said, why didn't they leave a bigger marker? Yeah. Well, maybe they wanted to be able to find it, but they didn't want somebody else to be able to find it. Oh, okay. Plausible. So, okay. That, yeah. That could potentially. I don't know. It's just a bunch of, like, what ifs. And because the backpack was found, new searches were formed in this area. Were they able to find out where they thought they were from any of those photos? Like, were any of these photos useful in figuring out where they were? I don't know. Like, more specifically. The, these photos, along with everything else, is what has helped authorities to determine that they were, in fact, on this trail. Okay. So, what I identify, yeah, they're on the trail, but still no trace. Right. Okay. But it was these photos that were like, okay, yes, this they were is definitely that. There. This is that. Okay. So, because the backpack was found, obviously, that's going to lead to new searches, right? Because this backpack was found in a different area than the initial searches had at least began. Yeah, definitely. During one of these searches... A pair of Chris's denim shorts were found on top of a rock, not too far from where the backpack was found. There are reports that say that these shorts were actually found folded on top of a rock. But then there's other reports that dispute this and say they were just found laying on the rock. So I'm not sure which is true. Okay. But you will Either find... Either way, it's weird that they're on a rock. It is weird. To me, it's more weird if they were found literally like folded nicely on a rock. But, you know, we've we've seen reports that say both things. One of the theories for why her shorts may have been found on this rock were um, that maybe the women started drinking water from the river, which would make sense. And we know that they, well, we're assuming that they were the ones making these phone calls for days and days. In order to stay alive for all these days, they have to be drinking water. And the only place to drink sure. water is from this river. So that makes sense that they would have been doing that. But this water is considered unsafe for drinking and it can cause very upset stomach. So imagine having the stomach flu or food poisoning and you know that, you know, what this can cause. Yeah. Vomiting, Bad. diarrhea, simultaneously vomit and yes. diarrhea. Like, so one theory for the shorts being folded is that she was sick. And so yeah. it was just easier for her to yeah. just, you know handle it that way but it is still strange that if you're lost in the woods you would take any barrier that you have off so if all you have is a pair of shorts that's not protecting you a whole lot but it is protecting you more than say not having any shorts on at all would be protecting you so i would think you would want to keep as much coverage on you as possible but you know there you go that's another just weird thing yeah i mean i can see taking them off if you were planning on staying in that area for a longer period of time but i can't imagine just walking off and leaving them right and i don't unless think, you have to leave in a hurry and i think most to me the the food poison or the water like upsetting their stomachs does make sense like okay we're planning on staying in this area for a while we're near water yeah you know um people might come here to get water people might pass through so right. like this seems like a safe space you know to me that makes the most sense but again we don't really know. Sure. The other theory is that the shorts ended up on the rock, presumably after her death. Somehow, you know, just over time, the shorts ended up there. So two months after the backpack was found. So this is four and a half months after the girls went missing. A very sad, grisly discovery was made. Oh, no. A piece of a pelvis bone. Oh. And this led to further searching of the area. And an additional 33 scattered bone fragments were found in the area. 
along, and this is graphic, but with a rolled up piece of skin with maggots and a boot with a foot inside. Oh, boy. So DNA testing indicated that these 33 bones belong to at least five different people. Wait, wait, what? 33 bones were found in this area belonging to five different people. Okay. Two of whom were Chris Krimmers and Lisanne Froom. Oh, boy. Okay. So, yeah, this is the human aspect of this, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. Things get weird again. Oh, again. I feel like we're in a constant state of weird with this case. Right. I don't know why I keep warning you. Like, <laughs> hold on. It's going to get a little confusing. Just say it's an escalation of weird. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, and again, this is a graphic, but this is just the facts of the case. So we have to cover it. But Lisanne's remains appeared to be relatively fresh. Um, the piece of skin that still had maggots and the foot in the boot did belong to her. And she was only between the first and second stage of decomposition, whereas Chris's body was bones. It was skeletal. But wait, they were discovered four and a half months after they disappeared. Mm -hmm. And she had just begun to decompose. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whereas Chris's bones were perfectly clean and dry, they almost appeared to have been bleached and possibly even altered by a chemical such as lime. And she was in the fourth stage of decomposition, completely skeletal. Whoa. Right. Now, how do you explain that? Unless they died at separate times, but they were found in the same air. Again, it's just like, what? Okay. Now, some people easily explain this away saying, well, maybe one set of remains was like protected from the elements. Whereas the other set was like more exposed, maybe sitting in the sun or in water or. But then how do they end up in the same place in the end? Good question. For the people who use that as an argument, there's not a whole lot of sun in this area. Remember, we're in the jungle. There's a whole lot of trees, a whole lot of cloud cover. When I was on that hike in Tennessee, which is not the jungle, it started raining. The water didn't even hit us. Because the 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 tree cover yeah. was like so thick, yeah, and that's like you know nothing like this, yeah. So this isn't just like out in the elements; it is very protected from like the sun and the rain and things like that. But here's the really weird thing: scientists have said that both set of remains are inconsistent with what they would have expected to find under these conditions. So Lasan's level of decomposition was much less than they would have expected. As if she'd been kept in a cool place. And Chris was much further decomposed than they would have expected. So neither one of their bodies lined up with the timeline. Oh, gosh. Well, maybe, you know, you said there was some chemical um, component to... It looked as if possibly some of the bones had been bleached or treated with like a lime. Uh, oh. agent however oh gosh there's more uh when tested there were chemicals found on chris's bones that were consistent with lime which would explain you know okay that bleaching. yeah additional additional decomposition yeah and right. bleaching, right and lime comes from limestone and that's a natural occurring element that can be found in nature right yeah there are no lime deposits anywhere near where the bones were found there's no lime in this area it okay. did not naturally occur. Okay. Lisanne's foot in the boot was a clean break. The examiner said that the chance of this injury being caused from a great fall or from another type of injury, like from above, was only about 50%. And that it would be very, very rare for this type of break to occur, but all the other foot bones remain unbroken. So this break didn't make yeah. sense. Like, it just wouldn't have happened and, this way naturally. I don't know. Could they tell, like, was it post-mortem or, like, could they tell at all? I mean, I don't know. Based on where they found the remains, maybe it's unlikely. I did not read anything that said whether they thought it was post-mortem or pre. So okay. I'm not sure that they were either able to determine that. But, you know, he did say it wasn't. This is not how this break would have occurred naturally. Okay. None of the recovered bones from either women, woman had scratches 
or teeth marks, as one would expect to see due to animal activity. You are in the forest for, or uh, rainforest. You're in the jungle for four and a half months, a decomposing body. Animals are going to wow. flock to that. Not one trace of animal activity other than the bones being, you know, scattered, I guess. But there should have been teeth marks and things like that. There was none. Yeah. So another indication that it's human. Mm -hmm. These remains were found in an area along with at least three other sets of human remains. What are the chances that five people are going to end up deceased in the same area? Yeah. So who are these people? We will find out more. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but first, according to criminologist Octavio Calderon, quote, two bones from different parts of the body from two people never end up together on a sandbar. This shows that someone placed them there. There is no other reason. End quote. Oh, boy. So like a bone dump. Yeah. OK. So here are the major theories. First, that they got lost and they succumbed to the elements. Okay, but their remains don't really support that. Right. Secondly, maybe they were injured and succumbed to the elements. Same deal. Okay, yeah. Uh, maybe they fell down a cliff. Maybe they drowned. Maybe some other type of tragic accident. Again, what about everything else? As much as I would like it to be, nothing else lines up with that. Right. Uh, could they have been attacked by a wild animal? Jaguars, jaguarundi, which are a type of cat. Pit, viper snakes, venomous tarantulas, scorpion stings have all caused deaths in this area. But again, I don't know. With there being two of them and being found the way they were, just to me, none of those theories add up with like what we ultimately Yeah, again, have found. back to the very beginning. Why didn't one of them just walk to the trailhead? Why didn't one of them go back for help? Right. Yeah. Uh, maybe they were attacked by a person or persons and yeah. how cost it. Unfortunately, I think... In my opinion, that's the most likely. Yes. Now, in January 2020, a mass grave was found nearby, nearby where uh, their remains had been found, that contained the body of a pregnant woman and six children. Nine indigenous people were arrested, and police rescued 15 more people who they believed were in line to be murdered. And one of the people who was arrested was the grandfather of some of the murdered children. And according to the survivors, the murders were ritualistic and used as a way of making victims repent for their sins. Oh, this so, is horrible. Yes. So there were some ritualistic murders and things like that going on in the area. So that possibly could explain, like, why this was a place where many different bodies were found. There was also, allegedly, a photo of two women, a brunette and a redhead. Because to me, Chris is a redhead. You said blonde earlier, but to me, it's very strawberry blonde. Oh, okay. I mean, I guess I could see that. Yeah. I and mean, maybe the flash makes it look more blonde. Yeah. Um, but there was this photo of two women, a brunette and a redhead, who were found on the phone of a drowned gang member four days after the women disappeared. Now, I have scoured the internet looking for this photo. Cannot find it. But allegedly, according to multiple sources, it does exist. And this tour guide, remember the tour guide, who was supposed to meet up with them on the morning? Yeah, the Good Samaritan guy. Yes. The one who probably made the call saying, hey, these girls didn't come back. Yeah. He was one of the last people to see them alive because I guess he was the tour guide for previous tours. Okay. So that's how we knew they were kind of responsible. Yes. And, yeah. He participated in the search party for okay. these two women. Yeah. Good guy. Yes. Right. He was also the one to find the remains. Oh, slightly sus, but maybe it's just a coincidence. Could be. Anyone who's participating in a search party could be the one to find the remains. But a lot of people think it's strange that he noticed them missing, reported them missing, inserted himself into the case, if you call it that. But, you know, went looking for them and then ultimately found them. Like, that's a lot of irony, mm. according to some people. Like, maybe he might have some connections. Like, maybe he way. knew where to look. Yeah. Maybe he, why was he so invested? And maybe he was invested because he'd gone out with these girls before and he liked them. Maybe he was invested because he's just a good person and we should all be invested in scenarios like this. Yeah, like, or maybe, I don't know, in small little villages like that, maybe he had heard rumors about these ritualistic sacrifices. He said, you know, 
maybe like I hope it's not true, but maybe we should go and look up there. Exactly. Maybe like all possibilities. Right. But some people don't like it. Some people don't like the fact that he was just so close to this whole thing. Yeah. And really, he's the only one you can really point to. Right. You know, there are no other names that pop up. And so he's just kind of the obvious suspect, I guess. Right. Now, what didn't help his case, not an actual case, but what didn't help when people started looking at him, he has some family members who are very likely involved in gang activity. And he himself had several complaints against him. And one of the complaints was that he allegedly had a history of getting a little too friendly with some of the tourist women that he'd worked with prior. Mm. Now, nothing like nothing, no attack, nothing like serious, but just like he clearly was interested. He clearly liked them and maybe made them uncomfortable and that they were just wanting to go on a hike. But instead, they had to, like, deal with this guy who clearly liked them. Uh, Nothing inappropriate, but yet not professional. But I don't know. Lizanne and Chris, I mean, again, I don't know them, but. You know, in your situation, if you're 20 years old, if this tour guide is creeping you out, wouldn't you just be like, let's dump him and get somebody new? Yes. So the fact that they kept using him, to me, means they at least found him to be, you know, a a decent person. Right. You know, he didn't creep them out, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right. That makes sense. It could also make sense why they wouldn't have called him to have them hike with them on this day if he did creep them out but then why have them scheduled for the next day oh okay yeah that makes that's a good point too or maybe they were just they didn't want to tell him to his face like yeah i want to see you anymore it's really all like it's all it could be any of those things yeah okay fair but that is some people don't like it some people look at him and say "Mm, something potentially wrong here so i wanted to share it And, you know, speaking of that gang activity, the drowned gang member and then this man's family members who, you know, were involved with gang activity, Latin America does have a lot of gang activity. And these people can be so dangerous that even the local police and military turn a blind eye because they don't want to be targeted by the gangs. So, yes, very scary. Rough. Very dangerous. Yeah. So this is not a safe place for two women to go out alone, just in general. So I'm going to leave you with these final thoughts on top of everything else that is unexplainable, that is weird, that like you just can't wrap your head around. Investigators say they find it very strange that the larger bones of the women were never found. So if they had decomposed naturally, there should have been many, many more bones found, specifically the larger bones, right? Because they're easier to find. Think of skull. But instead, only tiny bones, mainly foot bones, were found. So the the bones in your feet are so small, like little splinters, some of them. They're so small. So they found those bones, but they didn't find any long bones. They didn't find skull. They didn't find teeth. They didn't find these other bones that would have been so much easier to find. Mm. Now, maybe this could be explained away by animal activity. But again, of the bones that were found, no scratch. No chew marks on them. And what are the odds that only the big bones would be like, like out of, you know what I mean? That's just. Yeah. So the idea was maybe only part of them was brought back to the beach. Maybe that. I don't know. Maybe the long bones were used for other things. Ooh. If it is real ritualistic, like, you know what I mean? Like if it was ritualistic, would you keep part? I don't know. But it was just something investigators said, this is not natural. Yeah, I agree. One last little bit that's just something to think about that hasn't come up in this conversation yet. Oh, you've already got my head spinning. So I don't know if I can take much more, but now (laughs) I can't say no. So lay it on me. Okay. Out of all of the emergency call attempts, every single one of them was made during business hours. Is it possible that the women really were being held captive? And they were only able to make those calls when their captor or captors were away at work. But they would have left them with their phones? That's what I'm saying. I'm saying, like, what kind of an idiot is going to leave? Especially someone who has the capability to delete a photo off of a, a drive from their computer. Right. You know, I mean... 
So we're not talking about this as someone that's like unsophisticated that wouldn't think through these things. Right. We're not talking somebody who doesn't even know that cell phones exist. That's exactly right. Or doesn't realize the capabilities or those kinds of things. Or wouldn't ask the girls, do you have a cell phone? Right. So the only thing I can think of is someone who's just like so sure that their phones are not going to work. Wow. That they just think. And they were right. They were right. But still, you'd have to be pretty a lot of confident. Confidence. Yeah. Um, so either somebody's so sure that the phones weren't going to do them any good that they let the girls have them. Or the girls somehow hid their phones so well that they never got caught using them. Which, you know what? Here's the thing. If you kidnap me, but let me have my phone, why can't I try to make emergency? Why am I only making them when you're not around? Like, you know I have my phone. You're not worried about my phone. So why can't I have my phone out? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? So the fact that they were only during business hours when maybe they weren't being, like, watched so thoroughly. Oh, I don't gosh. know. To me, that kind of leads to maybe he it he or breaks, she somehow. It just breaks my heart. This whole case is just. Because in the end, okay, we're speculating what might have happened to them. But in the end, I mean, these two happy, adventurous girls, I mean, they they met their end there. And no matter what, it's it's very sad. It's very sad for their families. I love travel. And so I don't want to say this is a cautionary tale, but it does certainly give me pause. It just you always be overly cautious. And again, it's not like they seem to be reckless. No, I agree. So would it have happened even if they'd had a guide with them? Would it have happened? Well, depending on which guide it was. Depending on which guide. Maybe the guide, you know... It, and again, I hate to throw shade at him because what if he's totally innocent? Exactly. Um, which he probably is. Yeah. Um, nobody really knows for sure. But it is It is very sad. I would like to think that it was just like animal or something like that. And they were just having the time of their lives. And then all of a sudden it was over. But with there being two of them, with all the 911 calls, with all the just chaos that just surrounds everything. I don't know. Ugh. When I first read this case, when I first researched it i was like i think it's an accident i think it's an accident and that they just like one of them got hurt and maybe the other one didn't want to leave them and they just ultimately like succumbed out there with no food or you know i don't know if it was cold at night i don't know that um but i think it was just they got lost in the woods kind of thing but the more every time i like read it i'm like but if that was the case this would all be different. So I, I kind of think it was like maybe some drug trafficking or gang activity or ritual. I think there was foul play. To me, is the only thing that makes really any sense. Well, I definitely hope that something else is found. I don't know what that would be, and this family finally gets to know. You know, they can complete the picture right. in their mind because not knowing what happened to your child must just be devastating mm-hmm. and hopefully there's comfort that at least they were together i take comfort in that yeah 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 well that was definitely a tale cynthia and i was full of thrills and chills <laughs> mission love accomplished it. love it well we hope you join us next week for more thrills and chills thank you for joining us at the dark oak see you next week Bye-bye. bye 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 This has been a Just Us Gals production with artwork by Justice Holmes and music by Ryan Creep.